Um, yeah, I got the, the very quick uh, tour. It all looks amazing. Um, architecture lives, uh, I think, in, in the status that it, it should deserve, even in the age of access, which is um, uh, part of what I'm interested in talking about. Um, Different sameness repetition uh, in the city is what this talk is about. And Dora, I think her, her intro did, I think, very succinctly talk about this trajectory from, um, you know, autonomy at some level and engagement with an intellectual project, um, maybe a project of youth that's unbridled but thinks it's going somewhere, finally gets uh, conditioned by practice and uh, essentially by the city. The city uh, is uh, really the topic of this, but in a, in a way it's also the topic of, should I turn, have the lights down? Can we have the lights down a little bit? We got to get more, um, more hypnotic cinematic uh, contrast here. Uh, Mass X is the newest book. Uh, it's new. It's, I've been working on it for nine years, so uh, it's a bit of a magnum opus. It's 800 pages, and it'll be out in a few months. It's not a book that you'll be t uh, kind of toting around in your backpack much. Um, I suppose it would be uh, a doorstop or paperweight, but please look at it before it, it goes to that um, program. So I want to start here. Chip, you, this is maybe for you even. I didn't know you were coming. So I'm going to give you a few examples of the idea of sameness, but not sameness as the project of the banal. When you're commissioned to make a project, somebody's gone through a selection process, discriminates, decides that your form of difference is the form of difference that they want to engage, because the project of the same in theory, uh, precludes uh, the difference. Um, but I want to talk about the same in terms of context. Uh, Roland Barthes said you can't judge beauty on its own terms. You, you have to have a context to judge anything. If there's only one, how do I know how to attribute certain qualities to it? I'm going to use a couple of music references and then a couple of architectural references. And they talk about form and repetition, um, and repetition as a precursor to the idea of the grid, as a repetitive unit in the city. Um, we can't turn any lights down, great. Um, i also using references I think everyone knows, regardless of whether or not you listen to this all the time, but even the kids I, I know know the Ramones. In 1972, when they got together in Hollis, Queens, and said we want to start a band, and we hate prog rock, which is long solo bass music. And they said, we'll, we'll take um, the bubblegum music of the 1960s girl groups, and then we'll turn it into a buzzsaw guitar punk rock project. We'll adopt all of the street language that we already know. And in this case, Johnny picks up a most right. He only plays a most right, and he only plays three chords, and he only strokes the guitar with downstrokes, not up and downstrokes, because a real punk rocker only plays downstrokes, super fast, super repetitive, super minimal. So unlike going to the Berkeley College of Music where you learn everything and then you decide what your ideology is, they decided their ideology and then found the technology to employ it. Same year, uh, Dusseldorf, for, this is for Mark, uh, Kraftwerk, uh, don't start in 78, neither did the Ramones. They evolved. They started playing hippie flute music in 69 and 70 and 71, and then actually decided that they were true Germans and felt a certain openness of, of uh, uh, a German language that um, was an issue for uh, post-May 68 um, generation to deal with their own identity. <coughs> so. Different haircuts, uh, lipstick, uh, red shirts, black ties, um, different tools, mini Moog, Arp Odyssey, three chords, melodic lines, super repetitive, totally programmed. Sameness, I put these in the same category, hyper repetitive, very minimal, straight ahead. Uh, okay, they played longer pieces, 
But what I, what I want to say is the same comes in many forms. The same isn't banal. In fact, the same can be very sublime. So if you think samey, it's sameness. Maybe from here on out, we'll think about the same as having qualities. And the grid that I'll talk about is part of the same. This is my uh, modular synthesizer. It comes uh, piece by piece. You put it together. This is a single uh, module. This is an amplifier. <clears throat> That's a texture uh, a producer. There's a sequencer. There are several oscillators. You take all these cables and you patch them together, and every time you patch them together, you make a new piece. So um, I show you this partly out of indulgence because I spend a reasonable amount of time doing this to be able to kind of supplement the idea of the argument of what does it mean to work with something that's systematic. But then you have what I call aleatoric events uh, that every time you re-plug this thing in, something different happens. So driving around a city like Los Angeles in a grid is like that. There it is. So <clears throat> picture this as just a module. It does one thing, that does another thing. The city grid, you, uh, 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 Los Angeles is not completely a grid, but, but let's say it's edited for purposes here where it is. And the grid uh, obviously shifts from time to time, little uh, odd events and so forth, a little tweak in the grid, but more or less here it is. And it's filled in by developers who produce the city. Developers build cities, mayors really don't. Um, Artists really don't. Singular architects only do it from time to time, but all of this represents the substrate of what a city is, which is organization, whether we call it democratic, and we'll get to that in a minute, or not, is part of uh, what is going on with the grid. Now, uh, in an architectural uh, project from the late 60s and um, Rossi's late 60s period and uh, in, the, in the kind of masterpiece, as it were, of the Gallertese, a piece which is really the paradigmatic project for some uh, buddy like Dogma uh, or others who want to make a project um, about the city, talk about the nature of uh, not only the discipline of form, but really thinking about an urban problem here for which a rational language gets deployed and in this particular case with Carlo Imanino next door in the, in the Gallertese project, it wasn't that this finished a city grid. Um, in fact, there was a lot of cockeyed stuff going on in the site plan. But just as an artifact, you know, uh, whether it's a promise of Hilbersheimer uh, or the idea of the democratic, the neo-communist project of everyone will have a cell in the city, but the cell isn't penal. The cell is, is efficient and, and useful and direct and isn't encumbered by the problem of, of um, architectural style. So that's one grid that evokes the idea of the urban problem. In the very same year, the language problem of the grid by Eisenman is going on. So uh, one American <coughs> and one European in the uh, uh, music uh, relationship. We had one American band, the uh, Ramones, and we had the German band Kraftwerk. So I'm talking about some relation between continental competition and continental ideas. In this case, Eisenman's project, which came out of uh, a reading of Chomsky's um <coughs> understanding, be sort of before Chomsky was really well known as the, as the political activist, it was nascent at the time, Peter's grids were the mat raw material of the intellectual project. In other words, there's no self involved in the grid. I'll employ the grid, and in this particular case, rotate two boxes um, on 45 degrees so that they inherently speak to themselves in the multiplication and depth uh, of the language of the grid. So here's the language problem or the formal problem of the grid and grids are, have we been talking about them? I saw some beautiful projects, the white uh, plexiglass, what was that? The big flat, the what? Who did that project? That one's beautiful. He's not here. Tell him I said it was great. Okay.
uh, one last little comparison, and it's an odd one. It kind of comes out of nowhere at some level. And this is really just about sameness at the level of species. So, okay, we, we all know horses. They generally come in these earth tones. They have, theoretically, they have refined features. They're domesticated, uh, and they're hired uh, to run races to make millions of dollars for people. Meanwhile, the equine cousin, uh, the zebras, nobody bothered to domesticate this one. I don't know why. I mean, this would be just graphically on TV, uh, just running the race would be way better as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's got quirky features, at least in comparison to the horse. If we don't have the other species of the horse, we look at the ears and go, they seem fine. But really, they're odd and quirky when you look at the refined features of the horse. So I'm going to ask you to look at the quirky things in our buildings and the things that seem sort of beautiful and regular and actually cool because they clash about in very, very fine-grained ways. So there are all kinds of features as well as the project of the um, stripe. Now, I only show you this too because, uh, that's David Bowie, uh, <clears throat> 1972, the Aladdin Sane tour. This was designed, uh, his, his suit was designed by Kansai, Kansai Yamamoto, a fashion designer at the time. So, of course, the offset lines, like a Frank Stella painting uh, meeting the zebra, creating uh, bilateral symmetry like the zebra and so forth, and in this case, uh, with shiny leather, the features that you would give to materiality um, are very, very specific about the way in which uh, the same, or the grid, or the line becomes special. In other words, how you think about uh, materializing the project. And just for the record, uh, Yamamoto borrowed this pretty, I would say, appropriated it from Oscar Schlemmer of the Bauhaus um, from 1927. Pretty much the same idea. So somebody's taking a project. This is about appropriation. It's not so much about, uh, about the project of the same in this case. This is just a little ellipsis to say things come from other places. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a, a series of projects. Um, HL23, uh, the first one, which is finished in 2012. Then I'm going to show four or five projects, all of which are in the office except for one, which was an odd competition that we didn't win. But everything else is, is not built because it's, it's live in, in the office. And I should say that... Um, <clears throat> This project took seven years um, and spanned a particular time period when, um, after leaving SciArc as director, uh, the economy was good and we got lots of work, and then 2008 uh, came crashing down on us like a weird funhouse mirror, and we were looking at our cracked image of, of who we were as architects, and somehow this building you know, survived that almost like a... a a miracle uh, child, and we finished it in 2012. So during this particular fallow period in which we didn't really have any work, it was seven years of uh, several master's degrees of um, execu executing a project that almost seemed like uh, it was the lingua franca that everyone spoke at the time because when you're looking at people like Rem and Herzog, et cetera, the budgets were just skyrocketing. This was a, about $1,000 a foot at the end of the day and still economical within its, within its price range. Um, we had to figure out how to build a building that was incredibly exotic uh, uh, on its own terms. And then, of course, fit the building, which is really, let's call it a straightforward program. It's a housing project. It's a housing project for an elite group of 11 or 12 people, but otherwise it takes its place up into the, up in the city. And of course, we get the project, like all the projects, uh, thankfully saying, we'd like for you to work within the project of the same, which is the grid of the city, which is not necessarily banal or sublime. You need to work within all these rules, but of course, uh, you must perform feats of magic to be able to subvert and undermine that. So. 
The talk is really about understanding the project of the urban uh, situation of a city and how it operates on the work rather than treating it either like a political uh, 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 piece of graph paper like Rossi, nor strictly like a substrate to do weird things against as, an, er, as a language problem or an intellectual problem or purely a formal problem. And I do think Dora put a finger on it. There are far more, um, <clears throat> I don't know, exotic form makers in the world than, than us. N not that there's not interest in that in terms of a conversation, but it's always been less of an interest in terms of building the project. So you can see it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a building that's narrow at the top, wider at the bottom. It's, it's two bays wide at the perimeter. It's really one bay wide in the middle with a, with a stair core that works as the main uh, structural column. So by the time we finish folding the project and being promiscuous within the, the uh, kind of world that we had to work with here, we had eight waivers. You can see clearly the reference of the grid of the city and the places in which the building absolutely deviates from it. But in this case, the deviance is really about struggling to fit in both literally uh, as a building form and also in, to a certain extent uh, as a project which takes up its place in the city. But then there are lots of devices like David Bowie's uh, suit, which has different line thicknesses than the one that Oscar, Sch Oscar Schlemmer made, uh, uh, patent leather, which produces a certain uh, 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 choreography, I would say, with light on, on the project. So too this project does. And of course, one of the most notable things is that the structural frame is a decal in the, in the uh, glass as a ceramic frit. And uh, you can see the structure uh, lurking behind. It's an eight inch intumescent painted steel frame that tracks up the building. And the reason why we put the frit on the building is because mostly on the, on the public side facing the south and the private side facing the north, the blinds would be down most of the time, thus obscuring the uh, structural frame. So this is, this is very much like, I don't know if it's a postmodern project, but I would say it's a hypermodern project in the sense that we so desperately wanted to disclose the structure. We made a, a, a doppelganger of it. We made a, a double of it. But at the same time, it's not a project in which we're <coughs> necessarily trying to hide anything. In this relationship to the High Line, you see the X and Y grid of the city, and if there's any city known for the X and the Y, apart from Broadway, it's New York. Get out of the subway, which way do I go, right? North, south, look for the sun, uh, walk up a little bit, going the wrong way. So the neutralizing effect of the grid is very, very hypnotic. It's also very powerful. So it's a party wall building which continues the grid of the city, and then because of its program, uh, meets the condition of the city and starts to deviate uh, from it, you know, fairly drastically to the extent that uh, inside, inside the inhabitant gets uh, the, the straightforward uh, rectangular grid of the glazing reinforced by the normative hardware of the windows, but then the, the uh, slope of the exterior along with the uh, diagonal bracing produces graphically a relationship between the X, Y, and Z uh, within, within the field. This is a project in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a 30,000 square foot um, creative office space. And thinking about uh, also the programs of these projects, um, half the buildings I'll show you are for developers. And they're machines. They're machines. Uh, they're machines for profit, um, and we all know that. But I also stated that um, developers build cities. And while it was once maybe possible to resist them, and never for me was it possible to resist, actually engaging with them is a pretty powerful um, way to feel like you're working on the project of the city. The client owns both sites. This is a brand new building. It's a parking garage and an office building on top. This is a production facility. Is there a pointer anywhere? 
Do I have one? And uh, it's a small parking strip in between. And we were asked to take FAR from another site and place it um, here and essentially um, make a project for a new kind of public space or a different kind of public space in, <coughs> in Los Angeles. So this is a, a, a block or two in from a main uh, corner of a main uh, uh, street uh, going north and another main street going east-west. Uh, we were asked to convert this building into a commercial street. So the idea is that this is a smaller street like you might find in, in Hong Kong, a place like that, uh, that may be overselling it a little bit. And that instead of claustrophobically filling a slot in the grid of the city, we try to obviously work in section so that the building both agrees and disagrees with the X and Y of the city and meanwhile, uh, the project of the two-dimensional surface and the pattern which we also uh, use to have directionality and high contrast um, all serve the purpose to do a number of things. So this too is also like uh, HL23. It's a bizarre scenario. It's a party wall building that has to be lower than the building to the south so that the office building to the south can have views over it which are fairly spectacular and meanwhile we have to shape this uh, footprint so that light uh, and space um, can be controlled within the um, within the site this is the first floor of the building that's uh, this floor it's a concrete project the parking garage of this building continues below this uh, footprint. It's a one-way driveway. And the structure is concrete, cast concrete up to this point, and beyond on the third floor, it's steel, because we can't produce uh, cantilevered formwork to support the weight of a concrete structure without completely blowing out this building. So conveniently, we're able to just drop three columns with the maximum cantilever and then create a hybrid building. And in fact, the edge of the slab here are being hung by uh, steel rods. So it's a fairly curious uh, project from a construction point of view and material point of view. And in a almost typographic way, the <coughs> sort of inverted L making the big soffit and public space down here magically flips upside down even though the building isn't literally twisting. It's just the way in which we're shaping the footprint. So it goes from more or less solid with a void that connects uh, to the atmosphere and a void uh, below a solid which is actually framing uh, a public space. This project is in Beverly Hills, and it's significant that it is in Beverly Hills. Um, <coughs> and um, uh, it's been a six-year it's been a six-year odyssey on this project, um, and we're finally finishing the construction document. Six years. Uh, uh, that's um, like normal now for doing comp complicated buildings. Minds change, uh, uh, city planners change, and so forth. So this th project is, is also, I, I want to relate it very deeply to the one you just saw in, in many respects. It takes its place up in the city. It's also the same size. It's 32,000 square feet. It's uh, four floors, uh, three floors of office. Uh, there's a party wall condition. Um, except, of course, it's exposed on the corner, and we are working on a number of projects in cities that involve the corner uh, as opposed to infill sites. So corner sites, of course, take on the problem of the corner urbanistically. They take on the problem of the corner architecturally, and they also take on the problem of how to, in this particular case, make a building that if you just poured it into the site would be a three-sided building but we can't do that in a city that begs to have real estate uh, rent for more. And so liberating as much of the, the floor area from the, the party wall was really the project. So this is where, I don't know if these are quirky features 
like the zebra, or this is probably more in the horse refined one. I think the one before was pretty much literally the, the, the quirky project. So we managed to push uh, through some uh, tricks with uh, zoning to get a 10-foot cantilever in opposing uh, floors so that the building has a profile um, in section and obviously liberates primarily uh, these upper floors away from the party wall. This is a 18-foot uh, wide garden slot that goes down to only an 8-foot wide garden slot and a um, stair tower that divides uh, the side uh, of the garden on Wilshire from um, the back of the house. Our, um, we were asked to make a 100% glass building. Um, 100% only in the, in the area of vision from the interior of the floor. So if you just track that, of course, we, we have that. We have three floors of uh, modernist wraparound glass and a concrete uh, moment frame. We manipulated our geometry to settle the uh, organization of the building to the extent also that the core as it were, it's a very small core, is entered off the side of the street rather than in the front, which would bisect a very large uh, retail space, partly also based on the access. We were given no other limitations other than to make it a 100% glass building. So you can see we turned our attention not strictly to the detailing of the glazing in a refined and elegant way, but we put all our energy into everywhere else uh, that there were no limits placed on the project. So the corner problem of the urban building uh, and the glass building as it takes its place up in the context with Wilshire Boulevard, um, Mediterranean buildings, uh, uh, modernist buildings with ribbon windows, which let's say this project would relate to punched uh, postmodern projects, uh, new modern projects, layered projects from the 90s. It's like a urban urban arc of, of office buildings. And in this particular case, here's the context for looking at the work because programmatically, this one's not exotic at all. Let's go back to, um, let's go back to the Ramones for a second. It's, 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 it's appropriating a story not entirely uh, correctly because when I first started out, I probably felt like I had just graduated from the Berkeley College of Music and felt like I could make anything and was looking for an ideology to be able to ground that. At a certain point, I think especially when construction started, it turned into how can I make the most out of the least but still not make an easy project or a project that's soft intellectually, but there needed to be a formal project to make it work. So what, what it's evolved to is here's the grid of the city, here's a chunk of space. Kurokawa called the city just units of space, packages of space. That's when he built the uh, capsule tower, of course. So this is the uh, unit of space that takes up at a very scalable level the grid of the city and the grid of the building. So if we only modify corners either in plan or modify a corner in elevation or modify two corners in elevation or two corners in elevation and then an inside corner in plan off of a solid or if we take the basic uh, form of a floor plate and a wall or a, <coughs> a horizontal to a vertical surface and we produce a radius or a conic transition which of course leaves the grid intact on one side and then plays optical games geometrically on the other side. This is the law of economy that we work with now in, in the work. So let's say these are refined features where of course we've got <coughs> our overall box and then where we can and especially where it shows up and through material uh, consideration we essentially make modifications on the project of the same because when, you're, when your client says, I just want an all-glass building, for me, I'm thinking, well, that's, that's an off-the-shelf corporate project or that's a project in which you put all your effort into getting rid of the mullions and making a nothing project, let's say like Ishigami, for instance. It's not a project for us, so we have to turn our attention 
to the territory in which we can. Um, I know you're asking yourself, why, why the color? Why purple? Were you asking yourself that? Or would, if you weren't, it's cool, because you just say, that's, that's, a nice, that's a nice color. So um, nobody does purple buildings, right? So that's, that's a major degree of, of difference. Your, pardon? Charcoal? It, it's, it's dark purple. It's bad lighting, trust me. Um, so that's the first degree of difference. So one might say, yes, but color is so subjective and personal and, and uh, you risk, um, you, you risk a certain amount of detachment from it, especially if you wander into that territory because it moves away from, let's say, a project of modernism, in which case white, black, or silver might be your choice, whether it's default or by ideology. We did three schemes. The first one was a black building, and that was the Miesian urban project. The second one was a silver project, which the silver project is a whole other lecture, which of course invokes futurism. They didn't work because of a number of uh, extenuating circumstances, not, not about the color. So when facing the third project and never, no, never imagining that the project would be white, we made it purple because of its global, especially Western idea of status. Long conversations with the planning department in Beverly Hills was, we don't like the idea that we're cast as nouveau uh, wealthy and that chrome or pink or celebrities define us. So we'd like something, well, we'd like to think that Beverly Hills will sponsor great architecture in the future. So I made the association with the idea that this color is a global form of status, which as applied to a building is quite weird, but if you think about it in terms of clothing or the crown jewels or Wimbledon, it's a color of, of associations uh, that Beverly Hills would imagine themselves to be uh, uh, connected with. I presented and I told that story and I made that argument to the review board with the risk that they could say, we like the building, but you know, we don't like the color. Um, I don't know that that narrative was necessarily that compelling to them. I think they all just looked at it and said, it's really weird, but not. And I took that as a very, very high compliment uh, in this project. It's got a 20 foot cantilevered uh, roof wing with a of course, brilliant views of uh, <coughs> the landscape, uh, especially to the north, to the uh, Hollywood Hills. This project was the one competition that I'm going to show you, and it was a it was a strange uh, s uh, sort of scenario. This is uh, Caltech. Um, you've probably heard of it. It's uh, related to JPL. It's got a thousand undergraduate students. Super. Uh, high-end research in all these departments, Nobel Prize winners and so forth. Uh, this existing building, which I'll show you, is going to be torn down uh, so a kind of collaborative innovation center could be made. One of, the th one of the problems they have on the campus is that everybody's siloed. And while people do talk to one another, and JPL is an interesting agent in that, um, the campus wanted the idea of a social workplace. It could become a place just simply to have coffee and talk to a Nobel Prize winner or make a robot. Um, and these maker spaces are relatively popular and pretty ubiquitous now on college um, campuses. But as you can see, this is right in the heart of the campus. This is a, uh, an olive walk, and the whole campus was designed in the 1910s and 20s. Beautiful, um, <coughs> beautiful landscape. Uh, Italianate uh, revival uh, architecture. This is a building which will be uh, torn down. It's not a historic building. And here's the scenario of the so-called competition. It wasn't, wasn't a competition. It was a counter proposal. The donor, the building's a uh, $16 million building. The donor handed in $5 million for the naming rights uh, to the building. Meanwhile, the president went off and hired an architect who has designed a building that, um, let's say, the donor didn't think it was befitting of his name. 
So he asked me to uh, make a project for him to see if it would gain power beyond adding more money to the pot to present to the uh, president and to the board of trustees to see if we could move one architect off the project. Now, you know, if you're the other architect, that's not a very nice thing, uh, but I'm not going to say no to that proposition. Um, so we actually designed um, for this site one scheme, and I'll show it to you in terms of the floor plan, and we did four versions of the building, and I'm only going to show you one, because we were then competing against ourselves. There were no other architects in the room. We had the ear and the eyes, and so this was a curious uh, scenario. This is the plan. There's an arcade. The building is pushed three and a half feet into the ground. It's very hot in Pasadena. It was always going to be about a roof and also about fitting the plan of the building into all of the existing trees. So it would be a form found uh, plan. Number one, the roof would be prominent. Exterior spaces for shading would be prominent and otherwise a fairly open plan with one mezzanine uh, floor and this connection off the olive walk from here back into a series of cafes is an important um, element in the uh, site plan. So I'm going to show you, this is the context uh, uh, project. We did a subject matter scheme, which was a metallic building that looked, let's, for the sake of argument, let's say it looked like a robot. So the building is synonymous with what goes on, so subject matter project. This is the context project. We did a landscape project, which was a hypermorphed green roof project. We thought, we'll cover the landscape idea. We'll cover the subject matter project. We'll cover the context project. If you don't like any of those, this is crazy. I've got every possible card to play. You can't say no to all of them. Well, they did. Uh, <laughs> This is the contact project. It's a masonry building. It's a cast in place concrete uh, proposal. And it uses uh, the arcade and the context of the site, of course, as a, as a spatial typology, not a specific geometric uh, uh, project. But like everyone uh, who understands how cylinders intersect cylinders, our features on our building, of course, uh, take up some of the same uh, sorts of questions. So that little purple diagram I showed you of what I call the three chord theory of architecture, don't use any more chords than you need to play your work with. Why would you want to know 50 chords if your project is only three? So this is only three chords, they're just played in, in, in very, very different and very specific ways. So, for instance, you're going to see columns that uh, turn into walls uh, that produce arcades and then columns that are, of course, uh, rotating and creating graphic profiles. So the relationship between column as wall as a fin, uh, learning from Rossi, in fact, and then making graphic figures which essentially spiral out through the entire building here played out in cast concrete was our way to talk about uh, the campus and connecting to the Olive Walk, the idea of uh, um <clears throat> pushing down into the ground. No trees are taken out and we've got big levitating forms of uh, flying concrete that produce shade and um, exterior spaces and glazing which can be uh, quite copious. Our erstwhile client asks us to make uh, an all-glass building again. That must be a, a theme for exposing work and ideas. So these very large windows in this particular case allow all the passers-by and the students to uh, engage in, visually at least, the production of the work inside. So here's an odd scenario of a, of a, <clears throat> a doubling of a beveled uh, surface, a cone at the bottom of the building. Um, that already marks the corner with a, an arcaded element <coughs> that uh, again marks the corner. You could pass between or you can pass around. So the project rhetorically examines and plays with the idea of uh, a columnar uh, perimeter and 
in this particular case on the west side of the building where the trees do most of the screening, uh, it evolves into a series of uh, bundled uh, graphic windowed figures that just simply spiral all around the project. Here's the uh, symmetrical column, and in this particular case, looking like three layers of, of laminated concrete. Of course, you pour it in one shot and you make uh, uh, reveals here, but this is the extent to which, let's say, some of the abstract language that we developed in the 90s comes forward in um, a different kind of material. This is in Los Angeles. Uh, <clears throat> on the west side of the city, you can see more quirks um, in, in, in the grid, um, a place where the grid does show up, the infill of single-family houses. And this is a new uh, exposition line light rail that runs right behind this site. These are major boulevards. Um, and this particular context, at least on the north side of this uh, rail line, is largely industrial pretty banal and lots and lots of beige stucco in the forms of bed baths and beyonds and, and uh, so forth. Oddly enough, it also is the one project where the site already has its deformity built into it in terms of its uh, footprint and then that wreaks havoc in a way on what happens with the building inside. Uh, so the site is actually, although there's an arc, we turned it into <coughs> you know, a multiple sided figure you deal with the usual forms of um, extruding, trimming. There's no design happening in the first uh, three moments. This is all bean counting and metrics. Then we get into the carving project and the ultimate uh, form of the building. This is definitely a zebra. This is definitely the one with the quirky features. I, I don't think that this is a project that um, is supposed to be about refinement because uh, our client, which is, this is a middle and uh, upper school for 500 students, 6th through 12th grade. Um, they have an elementary school um, in a very verdant neighborhood nearby. Um, asked for an icon, but they'd like for it to be also very humble. So journalistically, you would say those two things are crashing into one another, like Journalists say icons are the work of the capricious architect and there can't be humility involved in any of that because your job is to produce a momentary form of difference. And icons, of course, can be beautiful, they can be ugly, they can be grotesque, they can be uh, whatever they want. But that's also the weird thing about this is um, culture decides what icons are, not commissioners of work, right? That's one of the weird things in a conundrum that even journalists get into, which is the architect decides to, to make a historical project, but in fact, people who commission work already premeditate that. It's just a way to kind of put that out there on the table, but none is correct because only time and culture should define it. And as you know, icons in the world range from the banal and the ugly to the sublime. For every person who thinks Bilbao is beautiful, there's probably five that think it's ugly but all know it's iconic. But in our case, they said, please make it humble uh, because uh, we teach our students to be helpful to people in the world, not the wolf of Wall Street. And, and it's a very liberal-minded school. So uh, in doing so, we take our, our big box and our form, which is uh, stuffed with a, an um, inordinate amount of program. We set about to, to create languages within our grid for windows, for instance, which except for varying heights of floors because of programs, the windows only work uh, <coughs> generally horizontally unless uh, within a floor to ceiling realm unless we want to expose structure in a particular way and break that rule. And they're never aligned and they're only trimmed by the panel geometry. And that trimming of the panel geometry you think produces a kind of coherency, but when I look at the elevation, all its quirks and features sort of jump out as being um, kind of offbeat uh, in a way. Ground floor is parking. The giant gym is a, is a big piece in the sack. Uh, and then we start public space, which turns into a couple of uh, stair cores. Here's one. 
um, with all the usual kind of defining features that you would find in a contemporary high school, uh, which is the kids can flow into any possible space uh, within the building. Going in and out of the project in the various elevations, which are very much a contingent relationship to, uh, again, uh, the city and the, the way in which the, <coughs> the form of the building takes up its place and then gets worked on, it's really a substrate for a whole series of events that add up to what kind of whole <coughs> might be for you, you know, to decide. And that was the case in this project in uh, Taiwan um, that we won in 2012 for a cruise ship uh, terminal, one million square feet. This is a 600,000 square foot uh, office building and terminal uh, behind. And with a very complicated site, a very complicated program, um, lots and lots of infrastructure and so forth, the whole ambition was to see if we could make a project that was a whole and still have its own autonomy programmatically and work in its, in its um, you know, true type of logic. This is a um, <coughs> overlook uh, restaurant. We made a tower to support that restaurant, so this was a driver for the idea of a tower because there was no tower in the program itself per se, even though this is 70 meters. But once you look at this whole project, um, here's the cruise ship terminal, the tower to produce uh, verticality to be uh, connected um, contextually to these towers. Uh, the restaurant, the bridge to connect back to the office building, which is lifted up primarily for the workers to be able to uh, look back to the city over uh, this horizontal building. But the scale of it, of course, at 70 meters, 70 meters to here is, is incredibly large and columns become entire chunks of building. But by the time you add up all of this, I mean, if you look at that, you might say this is, this is uh, one set of chords operated on and played by many people in a band because all of these uh, accumulations of things only work in and of themselves because of the limits placed on the specific things in which we use to, let's say, make a transition from a horizontal surface to a vertical surface in these scalable techniques. So this project, while not as big uh, by a long shot, nor as exotic uh, programmatically, this is a view from the south with a series of south-facing terraces um, <coughs> where the students, this is the gym here, the students can obviously flow into these exterior spaces. Two large skylights below are coiling stairs. It's a multiple itinerary world. This is really the, the project which attempts to take on all of the internal characteristics and the quirks of the program and feed them into essentially a project still dictated uh, by, by the uh, contingency of the footprint. Here are the two stair cores, uh, perimeter um, <coughs> classrooms and wet laboratories, et cetera. couple more, and uh, this is in El Paso, Texas, or this is El Paso, Texas. Here's Juarez, Mexico. You can see the fine grain of the city back there. And um, it's a city, the uh, kind of gateway to the chaotic south, as I say, and the gateway to the infinite west. It's a, it's a very enigmatic place. It's not big, about a million people all together. Telecommunications company run by two entrepreneurial brothers own this building um, I went to gave, give a lecture in El Paso, and it was the one and only time I got a commission after the lecture. The one thing you always hope, somebody will come forward and say, that was so brilliant, let's do a project. And in this particular case, I believe because the city is, is waiting for something kind of curious, uh, or hoping that something curious could be constructed, uh, our clients um, asked for they asked for a monument, they asked for an icon in the form of a 10,000 square foot extension to their office. So that speaks to the ambition. You can talk about the ambition and other terms, of course, of a client. 
But in this particular case, while it's a sign for their company, although there won't be a sign in, in the literal sense, this is also a, a kind of clarion call to politicians, to mayors, to city council people, to other architects to do something in the city, even if it's not in this form <coughs> of the project of difference. There's a stair that connects from, uh, of course, the third floor, which is the top floor of the building, to their offices. Uh, multiple generations of um, work going on. Uh, here are the uh, telecommunications folks. Uh, this is the father of the brothers who does his own stock trading. Over here are cousins who do cattle trading, believe it or not. And there'll be an art, public art gallery. So this project, while it's a private enterprise is uh, the ambition is for it to be a public building in as many ways as possible. It sits on a 20-foot square concrete grid which is being retrofitted now and lightweight steel frame cantilevering 19 feet into public uh, space here and 13 feet into public space here and they ask that we float the building off the uh, corner. Um, just the same way that our client in New York asked us to float the building over the High Line. I don't say that to tell you that I'm just a really nice guy and an architect and I obey the deviant orders of clients um, as opposed to invent and push your own agenda every time. I like to think that they're essentially speaking for us in a way um, because while this project investigates the problem of the, the cantilevered building, but does it in a, in a funny way. The building just sits on top of the parapet. It doesn't really float or levitate. It really looks uh, like the building uh, is supporting it as a large column. This is facing east. Um, this is facing north. No, no double skin on the north as we calibrate uh, no sun into the space. The sun is all mitigated on the east. And the west, it's also mitigated, and in the corner, it's all solid where the, uh, um, uh, where the gallery is. So the building is shaped in plan and, and driven in facade by the local conditions of a very, very, very hot climate. Now, at the end of the day, that description probably sounds like some off-the-shelf, I just want to do a good, sustainable project with first-order principles of... Um, uh, good environmental design without even employing exotic things like geothermal or something. It is that, but at the same time it is that, then uh, our small uh, <clears throat> project where we can control the quirky features, including soffit color that brings life to the city and reminds us of people like Baragan, um, where across the border there is no loss of nerve for any kind of color, but in this city it continues to be dusty brown, and uh, this project hopes to change that. This is the north elevation, which doesn't have any sun control on it at all. This is the south facade. There's one diagonal piece of glass uh, that's fairly large, but it's got its own proprietary sunscreen that produces a shading mechanism, very, very small slotted windows that are deep that don't allow any direct sunlight. So this is old school. Uh, passive Design 101 um, that essentially produces features on the building. This is the um, this is the uh, gallery off of the um, elevator. The building steps up because running underneath all of this is the uh, plenum where all the HVAC is. And it's a very lightweight steel frame on a 20-foot grid with no diagonals because this earthquake uh, world is very, very uh, minimal here. This is Vancouver. These are the last projects very quickly. Downtown Vancouver, 100 meter and more towers built up since uh, 1980. A horizontal, sprawling North American city that people don't really talk about very much about Vancouver. It sells itself based on the issues of density and uh, landscape and, and parks and so forth. And that's exactly what uh, is true about it, but it also asks questions about uh, North American issues of um, density as well. The first project 
relates to this uh, question of the machinery of real estate uh, condominium projects um, that sprang up over, over the last 35 years, both by local and out-of-town architects, that themselves I call snowflakes. They're the same, they're only marginally different, you have to look very closely, but they're made up of the same uh, 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 extruded material. So of course we have the commission to um, produce the project of the same, but not in the same formal architectural language, the same program, and then deal in the issue of, of um, difference. There's our site and the context and uh, the project. Like all projects in Vancouver, especially downtown, there's a podium and tower problem um, established on the one hand by modernism, refined in a way by, say, Lever House, and uh, our office is not interested in refining Lever House again, so we turned the problem of the horizontal and the vertical into its own particular problem, especially when there's no elegance um, that you have uh, control over within uh, the base of the building. 80-foot separation between residential buildings and 60-foot uh, uh, separation between office buildings. This is, this is a 35-story building this one's 28 stories, and uh, our client is building three towers in a row. This is 57 stories, and it's in construction right now. This is the zoning diagram um, model for the middle tower, and we didn't know when we got this commission that we would also be doing this tower. So I'm going to show you two projects. W they're both twin towers, but these are almost of different times and different, uh, 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 they will be of different genetic aspects and the next one I'm going to show you are, are uh, twins. There are view cones that cross Vancouver, there are 23 of them, which means if you're standing magically on these uh, spots, that these cones are defined at certain heights to clear out the mass of uh, building towers. It's a particular type of zoning that allows you, excuse me, to see certain features. In our case, there's a zoning, uh, this line right there passes across our site and you saw the top of the building in plan being trimmed. It's so that you can see this beautiful uh, twin lion peaks. This is the east, the one on the west is right here. So our project turns into essentially a doppelganger of uh, the lions itself. It, it's a form that reproduces itself. On the back side, the building is trimmed to keep shadow off of this corner. And then this is a proprietary slope to the project that essentially takes this found plan move and this really insistent sectional move to turn it into a building that doesn't have an erstwhile top on it and essentially turns it into the problem, of course, of the top of the tower, which gives me a lot of um, anxiety because this shape is not what I would sit down and draw if I had an open notebook in my hand like, hmm, let's put another spike on top of the bill. I would never do that. I would draw a straight line and say, let's work from that. I wouldn't want that type of anxiety or, or idea of difference. But here we are, it's forced on us, and so the project takes on the zebra-like quirky features uh, to make that work. It's a mixed-use tower. These are 320-foot uh, uh, units, the smallest unit. It's a micro uh, loft, as it were. Murphy beds, everything built in. This is an entire Swiss army knife of interiors where we will build all the interiors. This is an office building, retail space terracing uh, on top. There's the hardcore middle of the building. <coughs> this uh, stair core actually goes up and has to switch to this side of the building to go up into the top. Uh, meanwhile, at the bottom, the building has um, mirrored effects of the top and the bottom, so you can almost turn this thing upside down and have some of the same questions about how you end the building, in this case, how it uh, hits the ground in a way. It's also uh, a brick building, and nobody's building brick buildings in, in uh, Vancouver because, as Douglas to Copeland wrote about the city of glass, that's what it is. Those buildings were white metal panels and green glass. So here's where you resort to being a reactionary when you're dealing with the difference. You do that, I'll do the opposite. I'll find the ide ideology at that very moment to adopt the opposite project. But I have to say I've been interested in 
materials that have been outside, much outside the bandwidth of what we've been doing, which is generally involving paint. Paint a metal panel, get the chartreuse out, produce a graphic project that, that, that demands that you understand it that way. So I said, David Chipperfield isn't the only architect who gets to use brick. Uh, other, everyone can use brick. So uh, this is as if it was Robert Ryman and, and Bridget Riley coming together. These are almost like Ryman brush strokes. These are glazed brick and unglazed brick. And this big window carves into the base to essentially make the tower one big figure rather than a um, base and tower problem. And these are the kinds of uh, luxurious uh, balconies you get when you trim it. And there's the brick. Last one is the Twin Tower project, which I alluded to. It's on the other side of Falls Creek. It's in a much lower rise part of the city. This is on Broadway. It's a big uh, east-west corridor. They'll have a subway built underneath it, so it turns into a big uh, transit uh, system. It's like um, these are the as if these were the first two buildings on Wilshire Boulevard in, in L.A. It'll become a high-rise corridor. City Hall is just up here, so this will be a sort of precedent-setting project. They fall underneath the uh, view cone. There are 23 stories. This is a dormitory for Emily Carr college of 320 foot units. These are study uh, rooms. It's, an, it's a really great art college. There are four units in the big square, so of course this device graphically is about making the buildings seem less tall. And then meanwhile, the twists and turns here are um, gym and amenity spaces, but otherwise the buildings are very, very straightforward. Giant um, uh, retail space on the ground floor and uh, restaurants and stuff underneath this guy and also this and we've designed a park which is not shown here but you see the relationship between the two towers and the strange features between um, the two. So I'm just going to leave you with the Z for the zebra. It's, this is a monochrome one. There's uh, small stripes uh, on the window frame but otherwise this is the silver project and the graphic project and the one which agrees to the grid but also tries to make something, <coughs> let's say, between the project of the city and the project of language and architecture. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you so much. That was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about the Caltech project and the idea of chords and all the musical references that you used, um, only use as many chords as you need. I was reminded of in the movie Amadeus, one of my favorite movies, where they're critiquing him after one of the uh, <laughs> one of the pieces, and they said it's great, it's great, Herr Mozart, except for there was maybe too many notes. And he says, No, no, that. What do you mean? There's no more and no fewer notes than were needed. As if you could not remove any note or add any note without destroying the whole composition. And so you talk about you know three chords, no more chords, and your chords are like the vaults or walls or columns that are used. But I think that design students would benefit quite a bit from hearing you talk about how do you stop? How do you, how do you end a composition so that it's just right? That's a that's a great question, and I think yeah, it was the jealous Salieri making those comments, right? The less prodigiously skilled person, but it was also the <coughs> the beginning, probably, of a critique of uh, virtuosity, you know, at some particular level. I wouldn't say that to talk historical again. I wouldn't say that what we do is sort of Albertian, and the if you take one thing away, it all falls apart. It's not that level of um, uh, you know, perfection in that way. It's a, it's a set of, of you know, limited, limited operations for which you were right to point out, which is there are uh, no rules for, there are rules for the grammar, but no rules set out you know, ahead of time that say uh, when and where and how much or in what scale, right? Because A, it's scalable, the, the, the 
the pieces are sort of there, and then just like in you know the world of pop music, it's like C, C, G, D. I'll just have to double time strum right here, and then I'll do a pause, right, so that I'm not unconsciously copying some other song, right? So you employ very minor you know sorts of things, and essentially. Um, I don't want to take the analogy too far because at some level um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of saying that the building has any relationship to the, to the breeziness you know, of pop music in a way. It's really just about um, rules of grammar, let's say. Um, and the territory of how to edit, um, th that, that, that's, a, that's an iterative process, of course, and it's, a, it's something that um, then becomes very local and, you know, working with the team, we, you know, we make judgments about, let's say, making sure we don't, um, in, in our rules of the game, we also don't turn it into a project of fetish, let's say, where, where if we want to do something excessive, then there's, the, there's an argument for the excessive moment, and you'll, you'd say in the, in the Mozart sense, it's all supposed to be there. But if you took one of the notes away, we would say it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't, it wouldn't fall apart. Um, I think that that has emerged because of the way in which the office is working now with particular commissions. All the years and when I was drawing, it was better uh, beauty. It, it, you know, oh, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Right, because I was the one governing everything. I was the one disciplining the work. And now with all the forces at work uh, on, on projects, all the agency and so forth, for which I don't believe in the word compromise, I just believe in a, in a level of um, uh, um, a level of complexity which would force one to, um, let's say, deal with more heterogeneity than you might have thought that you know a formal language of beauty could tolerate. Um, Rems called it the big, and you know you give up when it's too big, and so forth. I'm I would never take it that far. I mean that's a super polemical you know kind of idea. In the case of Keelung, it was a million square feet, and it was a giant project, and I would say at no point did we give up <laughs> on anything. We kept you know tinkering with it. Um, but that's, that's, those kinds of things are, you know, hard to talk about or hard to lecture on and, and that invokes the intuitive side of, of let's say, my skill set because I'm definitely an intuitive person who's just been looking for, for rules my entire career so that um, I wouldn't walk around as though I was Eddie Van Halen and could just play anything you know, sort of vacuously. I'm always searching to try to be Johnny Ramone to make a sublime thing, you know, with less because um, you just have to forget about your talent at some level and just think about what needs to be done, you know, with the work. So that's been like a 30-year project for me. But that's a, no one's really asked that question per se in that way and it's a very good one. I, it's a bit of a rough answer, but I hope it'll su suffice, yeah. I have to say this this wide of an audience is like forever the widest audience <laughs> in the least amount of space. Uh, anyway. Any Hi, Neil. Hi, Albert. Yeah, no. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's always very engaging <coughs> and wonderful to see you and see you doing this kind of work. I have a question. Uh, it seems to be then all your projects a dialogue between the structural system and the skin of the building. And that dialogue not necessarily seems to fall into the same language. And how, how do you see that relationship which is critical in our buildings? That's, that's, um, <coughs> that's a great question too because I think that um, the projects themselves are follows on from the same idea that this lecture doesn't get done unless I'm where I am in my work with the office and so forth. It, it, it obviously it wouldn't be premeditated that long ago. So um, the projects where we 
let's say in the case of the purple office building, the columnar grid, the glazing grid, and everything that makes up the general X and Y, that's, it's super rational and it all lines up. It's like a good, it's like a good moralist project. You know, you wouldn't put the mullion here and not on the center line, you know, of the column. But in the, in the uh, cruise ship terminal and a number of other projects, including the school, there's an indifference to the frame and to the windows. Uh, number one, because of the potential of the program and the audience for it. So the purple building's going to have um, high paying, demanding either talent agents or hedge fund people, and they go, I don't want to call them in front of my window. Right? So this tyranny of the logic of real estate in this particular case, whereas in a school, the student, the student isn't understanding the view or thinking about the view as a commodity you know, to obsess over and to pay for. They're interested in other things. Or in the case of the office building in Taiwan, that's a state office building 17 meters wide, everybody working in an open, uh, that, that one won't be built unfortunately. Um, in an open uh, single bay building uh, for which the view happens, you know, when you go up to the window and yeah, the windows are diagonal, part of the defamiliarizing exercise and structure crosses in front of it. But we felt and we convinced our, our, our clients that this indifference uh, would produce a, a particular kind of curiosity, especially at night when you see the grid of the windows and the grid of the frame creating a more effect, as opposed to just a, here's the way it ought to be. So um, let's say windows that don't align with structure um, seems very promiscuous and not about rules, but that's just the way in which we set different rules that are outside the particular kind of doctrinaire ideas of this must line up with that but it's case by case, because we can work in an, a whole number of ways. Um, but we've found a lot of really interesting forms of tension between the skin and the frame, um, especially when we get into the issue of the diagonal. In the case of the last project I showed you, where the windows slope, there's no apartment unit. You can't, can't rent that. You can't get a mecco shade for that but they also track the bracing in the middle of the building. So it's actually a little bit like uh, a modernist project where you're tracking the bracing, but then you put it into the program where you can have a, a, a funny shaped window because no one's going to complain. We're regular architects who have to deal with audiences and people and, and uh, rentability and so forth. So we just look into the cracks for the territories where we don't have to do that. Um, but your, your um, eye is obviously very sharp and very trained, and you're able to see these relationships to the, to the frame and the skin, of which we spend a lot of time um, working on those very narratives. Uh, so. I like this project of the building here at the school, of which I was introduced, and that the material of your education is architecture, not to co-opt the next question, but um, you know, when students come to the open house at UCLA, and I'm supposed to be selling them on my school, and you know, coming to to my school, I, <laughs> I make sure that I've hypnotized them first, but then I'll say, so why do you want to be an architect in the age of digital technology? What is it in you that wants you to spend three to four years? take out loans, and then in theory commit the rest of your life to pouring concrete when your uh, friends are writing apps or going to work for Facebook or working in the quicksilver world of the immaterial world and can't you touch millions of people all the time with all of this work and can't you create a social project? Why on earth do you want to get into you know, a profession in which six and seven years it takes to make a project? And the answer always is I like making things. I like, I like touching things, I like the physical world and so forth, even though we, we have our digital technology, but you guys are here because of that. 
not having digital technology when I grew up, I only, buildings were my medium. I was, you know, obsessed like everybody, close read, going to take photographs of them, and so there was no distraction to it. But you guys are living in, a, in an age of access and distraction, so for you to be here to engage in the world that theoretically is the same as when there wasn't any technology, buildings, concrete, wood, steel, modernist materials, not everything's push button, you know. That's great that you're here. That's great that you want to, you know, study this project. And it's great that you're doing that and working within this medium as opposed to necessarily treating architecture as you imagine it. I'll study architecture in some way, and then I'll be able to design anything I want in the Hegelian idea as the mother of all the arts. Not that there's anything wrong with that kind of sublime ambition, but I think it takes a lot of work to figure out how to design a great building. Uh, as much as if you went and said, I can do cars, I'll do this, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure, you know, that it's so easy. So I think it's fantastic that you guys are focusing on that and doing it in a way that doesn't seem provincial, parochial, backward, completely reactionary. This is just the medium that we have. So um, I like talking about frames and skins. So is there one more question maybe? Any Here. other? Uh, so yes. as you said that the city is built by developers and then most of them wants to wants to do fast project and you know money making project so i'm wondering the relationship between the owners the city planners and the architects like how like when you design somewhat like towards more of a quirky uh, structures how do you determine to what extent it's too quirky <coughs> for developer that they can, nobody wants to build it, and then also, like, how much do you think the owner would take it? Do you know what I, my question? Um, I generally, um, ours take it about as far as we can manage to take it within the context of the project. Um, and, and I think that is the, um, a lot of it, quite honestly, in terms of a calling card was HL23. The one thing we had to do with that was we had to tell people we could design buildings for less than $1,000 a foot. Oh, you only design exquisite things, not $300. You, you wouldn't be happy doing that, right? And no, I would. I'd like to help build the city with, with uh, not so stratospheric uh, numbers. And so there's levels of fit and finish, obviously, to projects. But within those realms, we're fortunate to be able to um, work with people who ask us to keep jumping higher rather than tamp us down and, and in some cases, take as long as it needs you know, to get done, um, which also means that there's probably other interests that they're managing uh, that go at a different rate and are of a different species, let's say. So we do, I, I, I would say we sort of do the art projects, shall we say, for developers, even though they meet the same demands, but they don't have the same, um, they're interested in developing the design, they're interested in, in um, let's say, engaging with us as projects where they would put not only more time and more money, but probably more emotional capital as far as legacy goes. And in the case like Vancouver, what's interesting is uh, there are three or four really smaller, not corporate developers, and the first one hired big to do a tower, which is now under construction, not too far from the white one. And then th they, the other, you know, well, if you can do that, then we're going to do this, and then before you know it, um, Kuma is doing two towers, and Ole Sheeran is doing a tower, and, and uh, we're doing four towers, and it's sort of a New York world where people are competing, you know, at a certain fit and finish level. The papers still refer to Starkitects, you know, in the local paper, and everybody hates that, and um, it is what it is sort of at that level, but our clients want us to jump high, and... Um, it's a, it, it feels just like doing it in a museum, you know, at some level. We're really changing the, the heart of the city, I think. But it's a delicate, it's a delicate maneuver, you know, in conversation. I think the city planners are more 
difficult to move through and architecture review boards um, they don't make life easy for you but yeah um, thank you so much for your attention and coming tonight I hope it was um, entertaining and useful appreciate it thank you for having me thank you for coming